And let's start our subtitles. There we go. Okay, so uh, yeah, the original version of this that I posted uh, apparently got deleted by YouTube for being too long because I hadn't given them my phone number. But they've got it now, and so everything is cool except that that video is gone, and so <laughs> we're going to re-record it. Um, so the, uh, uh, it's part two of Zen A. Coelomorpha. And uh, yeah, the ones that we're going to look at in this section are going to be the Acela. And so coelom is an internal pocket, and uh, acelomatic means uh, that they do not have an internal pocket, like an internal digestive pocket, uh, something like uh, uh, in a coral anatomy, remember they have that sort of stomach um, that's lined with uh, digestive cells. And so these do not, but they do have an area that they can expose that kind of does that same job. So you can think of it as a really shallow pocket. I guess they're not totally uh, acelomate. But it doesn't quite look, it's, it's more primitive than you would find in any other uh, of these groups. Now the ACLs have some very interesting shapes and some interesting colors. Look at these with the little spots and stripes and lines. So these are all ACLs. And so remember our um, Xenacelomorpha is divided up into two groups. Uh, we're going to have the Xenoturbellids and the Acelomorpha. And so uh, Acelomorpha is going to uh, include the Acels and the Nemertodermatids, which are going to be in the next section. So let's talk Acels. All right, so what's inside one of these guys? Well, if you look up at the front, they're going to have some of the standard uh, sort of equipment that you have. So we're going to have a hermaphroditic individual. Uh, and so it's going to be making eggs up here, and it's going to be making sperm down here. And it actually has two little chambers, um, one in which it can uh, store sperm that it's collected, and the other in which it can deliver sperm. Um, and it's got these uh, wonderful little cells here, uh, right next to the, uh, they're kind of part of the penis. They're called sagittosis. And uh, if you're a Sagittarius or you know one, then you will know that that means, uh, that's the, uh, oh, the star sign with the guy that shoots, a, that has a bow and arrow. There we go. <laughs> and so that's exactly what this is. These are little tiny arrow launchers. And we're going to look at those more in more detail um, in just a minute. Uh, so other standard sort of equipment, we're going to have a big digestive surface here, which is going to take up a lot of the center of the body. And we're going to have this sort of retractable covering over here. So there's a series of muscles on here that are able to pull apart and kind of expose this. It's like, imagine you have a window and you can pull the curtains aside and so now you can see out the window and you can close the curtains and now it's blocked. Kind of like that. So it's not really a mouth, it's not really a gut, it's just kind of like a uh, curtain that you can pull back to reveal more of the gut. Yeah, which isn't really a gut, it's just a digestive surface. So other key features that you find in all of these are going to be our statocyst up here at the top. And this is going to give our little A seal a sense of balance and potentially what is up and down. And um, uh, up here at the front, you're going to have this thing called a frontal organ. Now that's going to be very much modified on uh, numerito, numerito dermatids. Yeah. Uh, and they're actually going to be able to evert and stick out their frontal organ. And it's going to look like a bunch of little spikes coming out the front. Really cool looking. And so here is the bright coloration, and you can see the coloration is actually coming from individual colored cells on here. Look at that beautiful A seal. This is a very typical uh, A seal appearance. Uh, they sort of look like a sort of a fat version of a bowling pin, and sometimes they'll have this little nub right down here, and that's going to be at the tail end. This is going to be up here at the head end. And so the brain's going to be right in under here. Some of these have eyes and some don't. If they do have the eyes, they'll be connected right up to the brain. There'll either be two of them over there. I think there are some that have one eye in the center. Um, but I'll have to go look that up. But yeah, here are the nice little pigmented cells. And so they're going to be making different uh, pigments in them. And yeah, the, it gives them a wonderful appearance. I'm not sure of the biological function of that pigment beyond this. This is a fairly new group of animals. There's not a ton known, but what is known is actually really detailed. Um, so let's look at the nervous system of an acelomorph, or an acel, rather, um, acela. Um, and uh, compare that to a flatworm, which is one of the platyhelminthes. So platyhelminthes are going to be over here in B, and our acel is going to be over here in A for acel. And if you look in both of them, you're going to have a brain that's going to be bilaterally symmetrical. Then you're going to have these ganglia that uh, are rather uh, nerve bundles, lateral trunk nerves that are going to come off the side. 
And you see here, once again, we're going to have lateral trunk uh, uh, nerves that are going to come off the side. Difference is going to be that there are these uh, anterior arches. And so we're going to have a separate nerve bundle uh, sort of going across the front of the uh, face of the animal and two other nerve bundles connecting that up to what lies underneath. Those are going to be uh, contiguous with this thing, this dorsal connective uh, nerve down here. And it's going to run around the body uh, like a ring. So uh, kind of a football shaped thing. And all these nerves are going to be hooked together. And so they'll all be running from the same brain. The brain will be controlling uh, all of that. Or that'll be where the uh, signals emanate from. And then senses are going to travel back up the nerve bundles and land at the brain. All right. So now let's talk about those sagittocysts. So um, sagitto, uh, sagittum is, uh, I think, arrow. Uh, it's either arrow or bow, and I don't know. We'd have to go look that up. But um, uh, osis is like a little pod. And so these are actually going to be a modified version of the nematocysts that cnidarians use in order to do their hunting. So you remember those, right? It was like a little pod, and it had a uh, kind of a barbed arrow, you know, sometimes poison tips, sometimes not. And then down uh, along the bottom of it, it just had this coiled up long protein chain. Well, this is all those parts except the coiled up protein chain. This is just a little uh, arrow launcher, essentially. But it's a reusable arrow launcher. And that's the new part. I believe um, nematocysts are single use in those cnidarians. And these guys are multi, multi, multi use. So you're going to start out with a, a pool of what we call neoblasts. These are going to be something like stem cells. And they can differentiate one of two ways. They can either become a muscle mantle cell down here, in which case they're going to just be a sort of a muscular sheath that's capable of squirting one of these little arrows out, or they're going to be a sagittocyst, um, and they're actually going to produce the arrows. They're going to grow the arrows inside, and so the sagittocyst will um, manufacture the arrows that actually puts them together, loads them into the um, uh, terminal sagittocyst, uh, which is in the muscle mantle, and then there's a sensory cell on the outside that's got a little cilium on there. And so this is going to be triggered in just the same way as the uh, nematocysts of cnidarians were triggered by those little sensory cilia. And then, boom, it's going to launch out um, the little arrow, uh, a little barb from right there. And the way they use these is interesting. So these are all lined up uh, in the male copulatory apparatus, which uh, read penis, yeah. And so it is thought that these either will kind of lock uh, the mating partner in place or somehow increase the um, transmission of sperm. But uh, yeah, it is a uh, dart-tipped penis, basically, on these uh, crazy little A-seals. And uh, yeah, very specialized machinery. This is all very derived from the uh, Nidarian... Um, precursor but you can still kind of see you can still kind of see the similarity i think to the uh, uh, cnidarian so here are the muscles that you find in a seals and uh, so the muscles are all going to be highlighted in nice sort of uh, orangey red color over here and uh, let's see we've got our mouth is going to be here so that's the m and you see all the how all the muscles are kind of wrapping around this thing and they can be pulled you can yank on these lateral muscles and pull that mouth a little bit wider open, exposing more of that digestive surface. Or you can close it right up um, by sort of push, uh, elongating those long muscles and contracting these little uh, cross muscles. But you can see it runs in kind of a grid pattern. And so you've got muscles that basically make a uh, sort of an oval shape and go around the body sideways. And you've got long muscles that kind of go end to end of the body. And then the other place when there are a lot of muscles are going to be down here in the um, actual male copulatory organ. And so this is the uh, penis area. And uh, yeah, this is eversible. So they can they normally have it tucked in, but then they can uh, turn it right side out. And when they do that, uh, then there are also muscles that are lined up here. I believe these are going to be the muscles that are controlling those little sagittocysts and are actually going to be launching them. There's another little look at the uh, musculature there. It's, uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. So you've got all these muscles that uh, the green ones are going to be opening and closing the mouth by uh, contracting. So if they contract, they're going to pull this a little bit further open. And uh, if they were to relax and you were to contract the, uh, long, the blue muscles here in the center, they would close down on the mouth, presumably. 
You've got uh, the long muscles that wrap around. You've also got these that sort of uh, come up to the uh, top and wrap around like that. Kind of interesting. But yeah, so this is how you make a creature able to move, uh, we should say, even when it doesn't have any bones. You just have lots of muscles and you have nerves that control each of these muscles and the muscles are just everywhere. They're not just, you know, connecting one bone to another. So if you think about it, we're really rather restricted in the way um, uh, vertebrate animals uh, are able to move most of their skeletal muscles. Um, something like the tongue would be uh, a little bit more like this, where you can contract it in different directions and do a lot more with it. So yeah, think of them as a living tongue. Why not? Um, so here it's looking in a little more detail at the... Uh, at the neural architecture, and so I think this is going to be one of the test questions, the neural architecture of the Zen acelomorpha, and so this is the acel um, neural architecture. The uh, state assist is going to be right up here. That's this little uh, evil eye looking thing right there uh, lodged into the center of the brain. Um, visual cells are going to be just one cell big uh, if they exist at all in, uh, in a particular member of this, of, uh, this group. And they're also going to be connected up to the brain. You're also going to have sensory neurons that connect up uh, to the surface on the front. So instead of that, remember there was that uh, sort of an arch of nerves that were running there on uh, platyhelminthes. These guys don't have that. They just have individual nerves that go out to the surface and uh, get the job done there. Um, so, uh, yeah, if anything, it's probably a more primitive thing. That extra little arch is a specially derived trait that you're going to find in the flatworms. But otherwise, uh, there's a lot of similarities, uh, I would say, between these two groups. Uh, yeah, fairly similar. Uh, and so in addition to being little hermaphrodites, uh, some of these things, uh, so this is an ACL called convoluta longifissura, and it can actually reproduce in the same way as flatworms by being divided. And so here they're showing a full-length individual, and uh, some of these will actually divide themselves in order to reproduce. So if they don't have another mating partner, I believe is when this would happen. Uh, they would, uh, yeah, or potentially if the environmental conditions were right, where it had to produce babies fast and uh, alone, uh, then it's going to make a couple little clones. And so it's going to start as a little notch. The notch is going to extend across right here. And then basically it's going to cut itself in half. Uh, presumably through uh, a combination of, combination of apoptosis and cell movement. So the tail half down here, which looks like a little heart shape, which is very adorable, will then split itself once again along the midline. And once it's done that, each of these two little tiny splits down here, boom, will turn into a new individual. Um, and the rest of the individual here will just grow another tail. So there we've got a little start of a thing that's going to be a tail. And it's actually going to be fine. They don't have uh, bones. They don't have things that they can't lose. So the part that's being cut off here, interestingly, I think is going to be the uh, male organs. And it looks like uh, they're going to keep the female organs and the mouth uh, with uh, the parent. So uh, this is a mom. She's just getting rid of her male parts and turning them into two little babies, just like that. All right internal organization of another member of this and so um, uh, in this particular member the position of these two uh, parts the uh, eggs and the sperm are going to be reversed but otherwise it is fairly similar you still got your state assist up front and the frontal gland uh, at least as drawn here is not very developed in uh, antigonaria which is another ACL. Um, here is the reproductive anatomy of polychory uh, poly poly Polycarus, yeah, polycarus, that's how you would say that, Gordon I. And so once again, uh, these parts should become to be uh, familiar. You've got your male gonopore, so that's where the sperm come out. You've got your actual penis, which in uh, some of these groups is going to be a star-shaped organ that's always out, and others it's going to turn inside out until it's needed, then it pops back out, and it's also going to have those little uh, sagittasis inside of it. Um, the testes are going to be over here generating little sperms that are going to be loaded up da, 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 into the penis. And the um, uh, ovaries are going to be on this side of the animal. And they're going to be maturing. So these are the cells that are maturing to become oocytes, little eggs. And uh, so then, yeah, the uh, sperm are going to come out of this part of one animal and go into this part of another animal. 
Uh, the female gonopore has this thing called a seminal bursa, which just means that it's going to store a little sperm up for when it needs it, because it's hatching out eggs kind of one at a time, getting them ready, sort of the way a chicken does, but uh, faster. And uh, as they become ready, if those sperm are still able to uh, mate, then they can just mate with a brand new egg. All right. So, um, and shown here, it's not, neither of these is really uh, an inside or an outside. They're really uh, acelomate uh, uh, in general. But uh, here is the uh, actual penis. Here are the little sperm uh, that are lining up. So this is this line that you see up here, the little sperm cells. And uh, yeah, this is where they come out. Uh, this is going to be the male gonopore right down here. And uh, this is the seminal bursa. And so it's set up so that it uh, doesn't look like it's going to um, fertilize itself, but it can. some of these can divide anyway, so they don't really need to fertilize themselves. But if you had two of these things locked together, uh, sort of front to back, then one would be able to fertilize the other. They'd be able to cross-fertilize each other at the same time. And so the little semen are going to be, uh, is going to be stored in the seminal bursa right down here until it is needed. And uh, then it's going to go uh, and actually uh, fertilize the eggs. I think it's going to go through these bursal nozzles. And that's how it's going to uh, fertilize. So there we go. That's the uh, long lost section two of Zen Acelomorpha, uh, reconstructed lovingly for your eyes only. There we go. Thank you very much.